Welcome to our Safety, Health and Environment channel. Safety in Construction Site Safety first. Your first mistake could be your last. Construction is one of the areas of employment where hazardous conditions are part of the everyday working environment. The construction industry is prone to many hazards and accidents that can happen if safety is ignored. List of hazards on a construction site. In 2020 and 2021, construction was found to be the main industry for fatal injuries to workers. Construction hazards are heavily dependent on the type of construction work that is being carried out. For example, working on scaffolding presents entirely different hazards to working with asbestos. The top 10 risks and hazards from working on construction sites are Working at height Moving objects Slips, trips and falls Nunoris Hand-arm vibration syndrome Material and manual handling Collapsing trenches Asbestos Electricity Airborne fibers and materials Let's start with working at height. The Health and Safety Executive, HSE, based in UK, found that in 2020 and 2021, around a quarter of worker fatalities were from a fall from height. This put working at height as the most common cause of fatal injuries to workers. Suitable training is required for all employees who work at height. Employees should be trained in working on different pieces of equipment and surfaces, such as how to work safely on scaffolding, ladders and roofs. The law requires that all employers must assess the risks from working at height. A plan should then be devised to ensure all work is carried out safely. The employee must have received the correct training in working at height and must be aware of the safety procedures they should follow when doing so. Working at height must be properly planned and supervised and certain approaches and precautions should be adopted. These are Avoid working at height where possible. For example, if something can be assembled on ground level, do it there. Use equipment with an extra level of safety to reduce the risk of a fatal fall. For example, a scaffold with a double guardrail. Minimize the consequences of a fall, for example by providing a safety net. What kinds of fall protection should employers use? Generally, fall protection can be provided through the use of guardrail systems, safety net systems or personal fall arrest systems. OSHA refers to these systems as conventional fall protection. Other systems and methods of fall protection may be used when performing certain activities. For example, when working on formwork, a positioning device system could be used. OSHA encourages employers to select systems that prevent falls of any kind, such as guardrails designed to keep workers from falling over the edge of a building. Examples of fall protection requirements for certain construction. Activities leading edges. Overhand bricklaying and related work. Roofing work on low slope roofs. Working on steep roofs. Beware on construction site, your first mistake could be your last. Extra fall protection requirements when performing dangerous construction works. According to OSHA, Conventional fall protection systems consist of guardrail systems, safety net systems, and personal fall arrest systems. Guardrail systems are barriers erected to prevent workers from falling to lower levels. Safety net systems. When safety nets are used, they must be installed as close as practicable under the walking or working surface on which workers are working and never more than 30 feet below that level. All safety nets must be installed with sufficient clearance underneath to prevent a falling body from hitting the surface or structure below the net. A personal fall arrest system is a system used to safely arrest a worker who is falling from a working level. It consists of an anchorage, body harness and connectors. It also may include a lanyard, deceleration device, lifeline or suitable combinations of these. 
Activities on leading edges. A leading edge means the unprotected side or edge during periods when it is actively or continuously under construction. Each worker constructing a leading edge six feet or more above a lower level must be protected by conventional four protection systems. Ideally, in leading edge work, the anchorage point will be above the worker. Overhand bricklaying and related works. Overhand bricklaying and related work means the process of laying bricks and masonry units such that the surface of the wall to be jointed is on the opposite side of the wall from the mason, requiring the mason to lean over the wall to complete the work. When workers perform overhand bricklaying and related works six feet or more above a lower level, they must be protected by conventional fall protection systems or work in a controlled access zone. Roofing work on low slope roofs. A low slope roof has a slope less than or equal to 4 in 12, vertical to horizontal. When engaged in roofing work on a low slope roof that has one or more unprotected side or edge 6 feet or more above lower levels, workers must be protected from falling by conventional fall protection systems and a 42 inch high barricade with warning line systems or a safety monitoring system. Working on steep roofs. A steep roof has a slope greater than 4 in 12, vertical to horizontal. When working on a steep roof that has one or more unprotected side or edge six feet or more above lower levels, each worker must be protected by conventional fall protection systems. Skylights must have a guardrail or other protective system. Exception. When the employer can demonstrate that it is infeasible or creates a greater hazard to use these systems, the employer must develop and implement a fall protection plan which meets OSHA and other stringent requirements. Building owners are always responsible for the safety of all people, no matter who steps onto their roofs. Moving objects. A construction site is an ever-changing environment, and construction hazards continue to increase as construction is underway. There are many moving objects commonly encountered on construction sites. These include overhead lifting equipment, supply vehicles and diggers, all of which move around a usually uneven terrain. Reducing risks should always be a priority. Workers should always avoid working close to the moving object. Be vigilant of their surroundings, especially if the object does not have lights or beepers. Wear personal protective equipment, PPE, such as a high visibility jacket, to ensure they are seen. Avoid OSHA's fatal fall related to struck by hazards. OSHA has determined that there are four main safety hazards, excluding transportation incidents, that account for a majority of all construction worker deaths each year on the job site. Dubbed the fatal fall by OSHA, they include falls, electrocutions, being struck by objects, and getting caught in or between hazards. In 2016, 63.7% of all fatalities at construction sites were from one of OSHA's fatal four. Today we are focusing on struck by hazards and how to prevent and protect against them. Struck by injuries occur when a worker comes into forcible contact with a flying, falling, swinging or rolling object. Of the fatal four hazards, Struck by hazards are the second highest cause of fatalities among construction workers. 1. Struck by flying object hazards. Injuries from flying objects can include being struck by accidental nail gun discharges, thrown tools or debris, or the tip flying off a saw blade. Power tools should be inspected to ensure protective guards are in place and in proper working condition. Workers should always wear safety glasses, goggles or a face shield when using power tools. Hard hats should be worn by all employees on the job site at all times. Nail gun accidents are one of the most common struck by flying object hazards. Workers should steer clear of the line of sight when a nail gun is being used. This includes workers who might be working on the opposite side of a wall of plywood or sheet truck. Misfires have enough force that they can easily penetrate plywood and gypsum board and strike the worker on the opposite side. 2. Struck 
by falling object hazards. Struck by falling object injuries can encompass everything from tools and materials being knocked off unprotected edges to a suspended load on a crane coming loose. Workers should avoid areas where work is being performed overhead. These areas should be cordoned off to protect workers from being struck by falling debris or tools. Workers should never position themselves under a suspended load. Tools and materials should be secured when performing overhead work using tow boards or screens to prevent objects falling or debris nets and catch platforms to deflect falling objects. Workers should never throw or drop any tool or object to avoid causing a struck by injury. 3. Struck by swinging object hazards. Injuries caused by swinging objects usually occur when materials are being mechanically lifted and something causes the load to sway or when a worker is inside the swing radius of a piece of heavy equipment, such as a crane. Workers should stay well outside the swing radius and verify that the heavy equipment operator can see them at all times. 4. Struck by rolling object hazards. Injuries caused by rolling objects usually involve a worker being struck by a vehicle or heavy equipment while it's in motion, but also include any object that rolls, moves or slides on the same level as a worker. Workers should steer clear of vehicles and heavy equipment in use. Equipment operators have limited or no visibility when operating in reverse. Workers must be made aware of areas where heavy equipment is being operated to avoid those areas. It is important that operators of heavy equipment are properly trained to avoid creating struck by accidents. Struck by accidents involving heavy equipment often occur due to inadequate training on how to safely operate the machinery. Personal Protective Equipment PPE Awareness of your surroundings and proper use of personal protective equipment PPE, can go a long way in avoiding injuries at the construction site. It is important for employers to alert all workers of areas where there is greater potential for struck by accidents to occur and to limit employee access to those areas. Hard hats need to be worn at all times on the job site to protect workers from struck by hazards. Hard hats should be inspected for cracks, gouges, dents or other damage before each use. Damaged or worn out hard hats should be replaced immediately. Hard hats should be properly adjusted to sit firmly and securely on the head. There should be enough room between the suspension and shell to absorb the impact if struck by an object. Prolonged exposure to sunlight, cleaning solvents and paint can all damage or weaken a hard hat. To preserve the integrity of a hard hat they should only be cleaned with mild soap and water and stored out of direct sunlight when not being worn. OSHA requires that employers provide employees with proper PPE. This varies by the type of work being done and the hazards workers are exposed to but items such as hard hats, safety glasses and face shields sh should be provided to protect works from struck by hazards. All PPE used at the construction site, whether it's a worker's steel-toed boots or hard hats provided by the employer, should meet American National Standards Institute ANSI standards. PPE should be inspected prior to each use to ensure that it's in proper working condition and free from any defects or damage. Slips, trips and falls. Slips, trips and falls can happen in almost any environment. As construction sites often have uneven terrain, buildings at various stages of completion, and unused materials on site, it is unsurprising that slips, trips, and falls are a common hazard. HSE reports that several thousand construction workers are injured every year following a slip or trip, and that most of these could be avoided by effectively managing working areas and access routes, such as stairwells and footpaths. Those in control of construction sites must effectively manage the site so that workers can move around it safely. Risks should always be reported and sorted to reduce the chances of injury. Some causes of slips and trips and how to prevent them include uneven surfaces. The risk of these can be reduced by providing walkways that are clearly designated as walkways, having good conditions underfoot, 
and being well lit. Obstacles instances of slipping and tripping over obstacles can be dramatically reduced by everyone keeping their work and storage areas tidy and designating specific areas for waste collection. Trailing cables. Cordless tools should be used where possible. If this is not possible, cables sh should be run at high levels. Wet or slippery surfaces. If a surface is slippery with mud, it should be treated with stone and if it is slippery with ice, it should be treated with grit. Any areas that are slippery should be signposted, and footwear with a good grip should be worn. According to OSHA, the employer shall provide a training program for each employee who might be exposed to fall hazards. The program shall enable each employee to recognize the hazards of falling, and shall train each employee in the procedures to be followed in order to minimize these hazards. Maintain general site housekeeping and ensure materials, equipment, tools and extension cords do not create trip and fall hazards. Do not store any items that can become trip hazards in walkways, aisles or hallways. For trip and fall hazards that can't be immediately resolved, ensure there are adequate barricades and warning signs in place. According to OSHA, during the course of construction, alteration or repairs, form and scrap lumber with protruding nails and all other debris shall be kept cleared from work areas, passageways and stairs in and around buildings or other structures. Floor holes are one of the most common trip and fall hazards found in construction areas. OSHA defines a hole as a gap or void, two inches or more in its least dimension, in a floor, roof or other walking or working surface. According to OSHA, each employee on a walking or working surface shall be protected from tripping in or stepping into or through holes, including skylights by covers. The holes must be guarded or protected by guardrails, covers and other conventional fall protection methods. Walking and working areas, including rooftops, should be inspected for potential floor holes as well as skylights to prevent falls. When floor holes must remain at the site for any period of time, they can be covered with durable material and marked with cover or hole to warn workers of the hazard. According to OSHA employees, shall always stand firmly on the floor of the basket and shall not sit or climb on the edge of the basket or use planks, ladders or other devices for a work position. Workers on elevated platforms, such as aerial or boom lifts, shall ensure personal fall arrest system is always worn. Always inspect fall arrest equipment before use each time. According to OSHA, stairways having four or more risers or rising more than 30 inches, whichever is less, shall be equipped with at least one handrail. Never carry items in your hands while ascending or descending a ladder. At temporary stair rails to stairways that are still under construction to ensure construction workers and other visitors to the construction site can climb the stairs safely if needed. Properly barricade or remove from service any ladders, stairways or climbing structures that are not yet completed or not safe to use. Noise. Construction is noisy and as a result, noise is a common construction hazard. Loud, repetitive and excessive noise causes long-term hearing problems, such as deafness. Noise can also be a dangerous distraction and may distract the worker from the task at hand, which can cause accidents. It is the employer's responsibility to carry out a comprehensive noise risk assessment and provide appropriate PPE where necessary. Hearing Conservation Program Hearing conservation programs strive to prevent initial occupational hearing loss, preserve and protect remaining hearing, and equip workers with the knowledge and hearing protection devices necessary to safeguard themselves. Employers are required to measure noise levels, provide free annual hearing exams, hearing protection and training, and conduct evaluations of the adequacy of the hearing protectors in use. Unless changes made to tools, equipment and schedules result in worker noise exposure levels that are less than the 85 decibels. Research indicates that workplaces with appropriate and effective hearing conservation programs have higher levels of worker productivity and a lower incidence of absenteeism. 
hand-arm vibration syndrome. Hand-arm vibration syndrome, HAVS, is a painful and debilitating disease of the blood vessels, nerves, and joints. It is usually caused by the prolonged use of handheld power tools, including vibratory power tools and ground working equipment. HAVS is preventable. However, once the damage is done, it is permanent. HSE reports that nearly 2 million people are at risk of developing HAVS. Damage from the disease can include the inability to do fine work, and cold temperatures can trigger painful attacks in the fingers. Construction workers should be given appropriate protection when using vibrating tools and equipment should be well maintained. Any kind of vibrating tool can result in hand-arm vibration, and longer exposure can increase the risk of developing halves, experts say. Tools that have been linked to hand-arm vibration include grinders, riveters, drills, jackhammers, chainsaws, these tools can cause hand-arm vibration regardless of whether their power source is electricity, gasoline or air. Hand-arm vibration syndrome can take six months to six years to develop and after the fingers blanch, the condition is irreversible, according to NIOSH biomechanical engineer Daniel Welcome. How can workers be protected? Experts advise the use of anti or low vibration tools that are appropriate for the job. David Rimpel, professor of bioengineering at the University of California, Berkeley, recommends employers purchase tools with lower handle vibration and reduce the hours of exposure per day. Other measures also can help. Wasserman and colleagues identified eight good work practices originally shared in the American Society of Safety Engineers Professional Safety Journal. 1. Keep the hands warm. 2 refrain from smoking. 3. Grip the tool as lightly as possible. 4. Keep the tool well maintained. 5. Keep cold exhaust air from pneumatic tools away from the hands. 6. Take breaks from working with tools, rest for at least 10 minutes per hour. 7. Use gloves that cover the fingers and are certified by ISO 10819. 8. Seek medical attention if HAVS symptoms appear. One of the simplest work practices is holding the tool with only the amount of force that's required to keep it safely under control. Material and manual handling. Materials and equipment are constantly being lifted and moved around construction sites, whether this be manually or by equipment. Either way, handling carries a degree of risk. Where duties involve manual handling, adequate training must be provided. If an employee is required to use lifting equipment, they must be trained in how to use this and a test should be taken to check their ability to use the equipment safely. What should your employees know before moving, handling and storing materials? Handling and storing materials involve diverse operations, such as hoisting tons of steel with a crane, driving a truck loaded with concrete blocks, carrying bags or materials manually, and stacking palletized bricks or other materials, such as drums, barrels, kegs, and lumber. The efficient handling and storing of materials are vital to industry. In addition to raw materials, these operations provide a continuous flow of parts and assemblies through the workplace and ensure that materials are available when needed. Unfortunately, the improper handling and storing of materials often result in costly injuries. Whether moving materials manually or mechanically, your employees should know and understand the potential hazards associated with the task at hand and how to control their workplaces to minimize the danger. Employers and employees should examine their workplaces to detect any unsafe or unhealthful conditions, practices or equipment and take corrective action. What are the potential hazards for workers? Workers frequently cite the weight and bulkiness of objects that they lift as major contributing factors to their injuries. In 1999, for example, more than 420,000 workplace accidents resulted in back injuries. Bending, followed by twisting and turning, were the more commonly cited movements that caused back injuries. 
Other hazards include falling objects, improperly stacked materials, and various types of equipment. You should make your employees aware of potential injuries that can occur when manually moving materials, including the following. Strains and sprains from lifting loads improperly or from carrying loads that are either too large or too heavy. Fractures and bruises caused by being struck by materials or by being caught in pinch points and cuts and bruises caused by falling materials that have been improperly stored or by incorrectly cutting ties or other securing devices. Collapsing trenches. A common occurrence on construction sites is the collapsing of trenches with workers inside. Further, a building that is being demolished or under construction can suddenly and unexpectedly collapse, which can seriously injure or even kill those inside. Precautions for collapse need to be taken before work starts. If the project requires a trench, site managers should consider the kind of support that is best suited for the trench. Ensure the trench is fully secure. Regularly inspect the trench both before and during the work shift. OSHA has made reducing trenching and excavation hazards the agency's priority goal. Trench collapses or cave-ins pose the greatest risk to workers' lives. To prevent cave-ins, slope or bench trench walls, shore trench walls with supports or shield trench walls with trench boxes. Employers should also ensure there is a safe way to enter and exit the trench. Keep materials away from the edge of the trench. Look for standing water or atmospheric hazards. Never enter a trench unless it has been properly inspected. Asbestos. Asbestos refers to a set of six naturally occurring fibrous minerals. When materials that contain asbestos are disturbed or damaged, these fibers are released into the air. Inhaling these fibers can cause fatal and serious diseases such as lung cancer, asbestosis, and pleural thickening. Asbestos kills around 5,000 workers per year, and an average of 20 tradespeople die every week as a result of past exposure. An estimated 500,000 public buildings in the UK are thought to contain asbestos. If there is asbestos on the construction site, workers must be informed where it is. They must be trained in what to do should they come across suspicious materials that may contain asbestos. Electricity. It is harmful to be exposed to electrical live parts. Harm can occur either by touching live parts directly or indirectly by a conducting object or material. HSE reports that 1,000 electrical accidents at work are reported every year. Most of these accidents arise from contact with overhead or underground power cables and electrical equipment machinery. Electric shocks are a common cause for falls from ladders, scaffolds and other work platforms. There is also a growing number of electrocutions involving workers who are not qualified electricians but who are carrying out electrical work on construction sites. Many workers are unaware of the potential electrical hazards present in their work environment, which makes them more vulnerable to the danger of electrocution. The employer shall instruct each employee in the recognition and avoidance of unsafe conditions and the regulations applicable to his work environment to control or eliminate any hazards or other exposure to illness or injury. The following alerts are associated with electrical injuries, preventing worker deaths and injuries from contacting overhead power lines with metal ladders, preventing electrocutions of crane operators and crew members working near overhead power lines, preventing injuries and deaths from metal reinforced hydraulic hoses, preventing electrocutions during work with scaffolds near overhead power lines, preventing electrocutions from contact between cranes and power lines, airborne fibers and materials. Unsurprisingly, a lot of dust is produced on construction sites. The dust on construction sites is often an invisible, fine and toxic mixture of hazardous materials and fibers. This can damage the lungs and lead to diseases such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma and silicosis. The warning signs required shall bear the sign danger. S. The duty of all employers to ensure protective equipment is used. 
simply providing it is not enough. Asbestos-containing material ACM means any material containing more than 1% asbestos. Presumed asbestos-containing material means thermal system insulation and surfacing material found in buildings constructed no later than 1980. Surfacing ACM means surfacing material which contains more than 1% asbestos. Surfacing material means material that is sprayed, troweled on or otherwise applied to surfaces such as acoustical plaster on ceilings and fireproofing materials on structural members or other materials on surfaces for acoustical, fireproofing and other purposes. Thermal system insulation means asbestos-containing material applied to pipes, fittings, boilers, breaching, tanks, ducts or other structural components to prevent heat loss or gain. Thermal system insulation ACM, means thermal system insulation which contains more than 1% asbestos. The employer shall ensure that no employee is exposed to an airborne concentration of asbestos in excess of 0.1 fiber per cubic centimeter of air as an 8-hour time-weighted average. For chemical manufacturers, importers, distributors and employers shall comply with all requirements of the hazard communication standard for asbestos. Types of personal protective equipment. Head protection. Head protection is required on almost all construction sites. It is important for construction work to be organized to minimize all risks to workers, however. It is likely that hazards will still remain and everyone will be required to wear safety helmets at all times while on site. The employer shall ensure that each affected employee wears a protective helmet when working in areas where there is a potential for injury to the head from falling objects the only exception to the hard hat rule is for Sikhs who wear turbans. They are exempt from the legal responsibility of wearing a hard hat on site, however. It is important to stress the risks they are taking by not wearing head protection. Acceptable head protection should be in good condition. Do not wear damaged PPE. If it's damaged, it must be thrown away and replaced by the employer be a good fit for each individual and be worn properly. Not prevent someone from wearing hearing protection when required. Only be purchased from a reputable supplier. Ear protection. Ear protection is needed to protect workers from noise hazards. Both the exposure duration and the sound level workers are submitted to can contribute to ear damage. Even if workers are only subjected for a short duration, very high-level sounds can still pose a hazard to the ears. Therefore, it is necessary for all workers to be provided with the correct type of hearing protection for the type of work they are undertaking. OSHA NIOSH recommends that workers shall be required to wear hearing protectors when engaged in work that exposes them to noise that equals or exceeds 85 dBA as an ATAR TWA. The employer shall provide hearing protectors at no cost to the workers. Hearing protectors shall attenuate noise sufficiently to keep the workers real-world exposure below 85 decibels as an ATAR TWA. Workers exposed to any single impulse noise level that exceed 140 decibels, those whose ATAR TWA exposures exceed 100 dBA should wear double hearing protection they should wear earplugs and earmuffs simultaneously. Foot and leg protection. Construction workers are always be expected to wear protective footwear while on site. The bones in the foot are easily damaged, with an injury to muscle or tendons potentially prohibiting normal foot movement for several months. Therefore, it is highly important to take precautions that minimize the risk of a foot injury. The ideal foot PPE encompasses steel toe caps to protect from dropped objects and steel midsole protection to protect against puncture or penetration wounds from stepping on sharp objects. The employer shall ensure that each affected employee uses protective footwear when working in areas where there is a danger of foot injuries due to falling or rolling objects or objects piercing the sole 
or when the use of protective footwear will protect the affected employee from an electrical hazard, such as a static discharge or electric shock hazard, that remains after the employer takes other necessary protective measures. Eye and face protection. The employer shall ensure that each affected employee uses appropriate eye or face protection when exposed to eye or face hazards from flying particles, molten metal, liquid chemicals, acids or caustic liquids, chemical gases or vapors, or potentially injurious light radiation. It is important to wear eye and face protection when at risk of hazards involving chemical or metal splashes, dust, projectiles, gas, vapors and radiation. The types of eye protection available are safety spectacles, goggles, face screens, face shields, visors. When selecting eye and face protection, it is important to ensure that it is task suitable and that the correct fit is selected for each worker. If not, workers will still be vulnerable to risks. Lung protection. Lung protection is commonly required when working on a construction site as workers often encounter hazards such as dust, gases and vapors. When selecting lung PPE, it is important to ensure that the chosen piece of equipment fits the intended user properly. If incorrectly fitting respiratory PPE is selected, an adequate seal might not be formed, leaving workers susceptible to workplace hazards. Applies the OSHA standard number 1910.134 to all occupational airborne exposures to contaminated air when the employee is exposed to a hazardous level of an airborne contaminant, it is required by the employer to wear a respirator or permitted to wear a respirator. Examples of lung protection include filtering face pieces, respirators, power-assisted respirators, self-contained breathing apparatus, fresh air hose. It is important to ensure that the right type of respirator filter is used for the specified hazard, as each filter is only suitable for a small range of substances. Additionally, filters only have a limited lifespan. Therefore, if exposed to high levels of harmful fumes, confined spaces or atmospheres with a shortage of oxygen, workers must only use breathing apparatus, never use filtering cartridges. Whole body protection. When working on a construction site, there might be occasions when workers are required to work with contaminated dust such as asbestos or may be at risk from chemical or metal splashes, spray from pressure leaks or spray guns, entanglement of their own clothing, impact or penetration. In these situations, the use of conventional or disposable overalls, boiler suits, aprons or chemical suits made from various materials might be required to protect from workplace hazards. OSHA requires that the employer shall ensure that each affected employee uses appropriate hand protection and other protective clothing where there is exposure to hazards such as skin absorption of harmful substances, severe cuts or lacerations, severe abrasions, punctures, chemical burns, thermal burns, harmful temperature extremes, and sharp objects. If you liked this video, do not forget to press the like button, share and subscribe to our channel, and ring the bell to be notified for the new videos available.